Have you seen, any of you, that image of the dying polar bear? It's right behind me now, I hope. And I sent it out in a tweet, and it got more than a thousand retweets. And Twitter tells me that it has been seen by more than 100,000 people. What happens is that ice bears need floating ice so they can hunt for seal. But because of man-made climate change, there's less ice and therefore less food for the ice bear. And it's this picture and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see. I didn't make this video, it was um, uh, filmed by, by Paul Nicklin. Um, if you love nature, follow him, he's got amazing stuff. But the image of the polar bear as the symbol for climate change is showing only a fraction of the real story of climate change. Climate change is so much more than that. What we do by changing the atmosphere, by burning fossil fuels and deforestation and a number of other activities, and what we have done now is basically put a kind of blanket around our planet that traps the heat of the sun, it doesn't go out anymore. And every single second, an amount of energy equal to four Hiroshima bombs is entering our planetary ecosystem and not leaving it. And then what happens? Most of that energy goes in the oceans. The oceans are warm warming, we see acidification of the oceans, we see dying coral, we see that the ice in the Arctic is melting, and we see that the ice sheets in Greenland are melting, the ice sheets in Antarctica are melting. We so sea level rise that impacts our cities. Eight of the ten biggest cities in the world are, are built on the coastlines. Um, we see all kinds of changes in the weather. We see more extreme weather. Wet regions get wetter, dry regions get drier. Uh, we see uh, forest fires. There's just so much happening on our planet. And I could easily fill this whole talk with uh, describing what else is happening. And that means for us that in, in the culture that we have created, there's just so much that we have to adapt to and work on. The ice bear was one tweet I sent out, but about a week earlier, there was another tweet that I sent out. Um, this is Natanya. Natanya is 14 and lives in Malawi. She's a victim of climate change. That is not a direct victim like somebody living on a low-lying island in the Pacific and the sea level is rising and therefore you have to leave and there's actually no international law that recognizes you as a climate refugee. But she's a victim of climate change because last year, because of man-made climate change, there's so much more floods in Malawi and the floods had washed away the fertile ground where her parents were making a living and the parents of her parents before that. That fertile ground is washed away. There's no more income in the family. So the family was completely impoverished. And then a man passes by and says, I want to marry your daughter, and I pay you 25 euros for it. And the family had no other choice than to accept it, because the little, little food they had to use for the smallest children, they hated it, they, unlike you know, her older sisters, they were married when they were like 18. Now she is 14 years old, has a baby on her lap, and watches other children walking to school. This is one case. This is one victim of climate change. Only in Malawi, and if you know the map of Africa, it's not certainly not the biggest country in Africa. Only in Malawi, there's one and a half million girls that are now at risk of being married while they are still a child, and that is because of climate change. These are the kind of numbers that we're talking about. This is collected by Brides in the Sun, a very good initiative of a couple of journalists, and they're working on this issue. So that is climate change, and climate change is, is well, we will see it in all kinds of, of, um, of, of different forms, and it will have an impact on our lives, it will have an impact on human security, and it will have an impact on international security. And that relationship between climate change and security is actually what brings me now to The Hague, where we have the Conference on Planetary Security. It's already the third conference that we do. It's an annual event here in The Hague, 
and it's a good place to do it. It's the international city for peace and justice. So if anywhere in the world we want to talk about these issues, like new issues that are not addressed anywhere else in the field of international peace and justice, we should do it here in The Hague. It's a tradition of more than 100 years old. And constantly we have new issues. This is one to stay. And I hope that this debate will stay here in The Hague. We build a community of the best experts in the world that annually come here together. And they exchange their knowledge. But it's not just that. The other thing that we are doing, we're connecting these experts and their knowledge to policymakers. Policymakers that are in a position to make change. And they should know about the impacts of climate change on security, and they should work towards taking the right measures and they can get the right people organized. And I am passionate about climate change, informing as many people as I can about the impacts of climate change, what it will mean for us, but also what we can do about it. But climate was not my first passion at all. When I was a child, hardly anybody in the world spoke about climate change. And even the scientists that knew about it, because the basic science is quite simple, it's actually 19th century knowledge, although some people still deny it. But climate change is, in those days, it was, we knew the mechanism, but even the scientists had not expected that by this time we would experience already so much climate change, and we were just at the beginning. So my passion, when I was really young, was actually islands. And I can trace that back to when I was about six years old, that my grandfather, who was a history teacher and a great storyteller, he told me the story of Robinson Crusoe. And I was fascinated by this story, by this sailor who was marooned on an island and then all by himself had to use the local resources to make a living for himself. And he actually made quite a good living until he was saved so many years later. And after that, I got so passionate about islands that I started collecting books of islands and maps. And if you would see my house, there's just bookshelves full of books about islands. The more small and insignificant the island is, the bigger the book is that I've read about it. And I could probably fill many hours talking about islands. You would get completely bored. But the interesting thing is, why do I get to islands? Because it's interesting to follow the history of these islands. And if you read about a lot of them, you often see a societal collapse on islands. And a typical story would read something like this, that for a long time people live on an island, it goes okay, and then the economy starts to grow. So people cut a bit more forest, start to grow more fields, more children are born, they start to cut more forest, and at a certain moment all the trees are gone. And then the fertile grounds are washed away in the rain, and then they don't even have trees to make canoes to go fishing, or to have canoes to trade with other islands. Actually, there's nothing to trade anymore because you have no fish, you have no produce anymore. And that's how those societies collapse. And then if you look at our planet, you see that little spot there. So we're passing Saturn here. This is a real picture by NASA. So we're passing Saturn, and there you see our little planet. It is so much more isolated than any island in whatever ocean you can find. There is no other planet. There's no way that we are with, you know, we're now with 7 billion people. Mid-century, it will be 9 billion people. End of century, it will be 11 billion people. It's not that those 4 billion people, we are going to put them in a big canoe or a rocket and send them off to another island in space. This is all we have. And this is also the key to the problem that we are facing. As the Club of Rome already said in the early 1970s, you cannot have infinite economic growth and population growth on a finite planet. It simply doesn't work. And we are now at that phase that we are reaching that point. As they had predicted, they said somewhere between now and 100 years it will go wrong. We're now halfway. It was a good prediction. So we are now, in, at this moment, in these kind of difficulties. So, um, in, uh, in, in, in short, to where, where, do you, where do we go from here? We, we see those um, islands kind of collapsing, uh, that, that culture collapsing on islands. We see that happening in our planet. And if you look at the islands, you notice that that collapse often goes quite suddenly. Slowly the economy and everything is growing, and then they go over a cliff. And that works a bit like you learn probably at high school, like this lily pond that every 
day, there are twice as many lilies in the pond. And after 20 days, the lily pond's full, and there's no room for the lilies. They're all dying. At day 19, there's no problem, right? Because there's still half a pond. That is the problem that we are facing. And the other thing you learn from those islands that collapse is often um, accompanied with a lot of violence. There's the security component. And that's where the whole story comes together. So learning from islands, seeing how those cultures collapse, seeing our planet as an island, and then being afraid for what's going to happen. And that was my career that was roughly for half on security and the other half was in environmental issues. I suddenly, some 10 years ago, saw those two issues coming together. So what can you do with this story? And there I will end with giving you a little bit of advice. What is absolutely important is that each and every one on this planet is doing their best not to increase the problem of climate change. So take your bicycle instead of a car. Don't fly that much. Put your heating a bit lower or the air conditioning or whatever you're using. Don't eat meat. One kilo of beef takes 15,000 15, liters of, of water. And you put about 30 or 35 times as much energy in it as you take out of it. Just use a plant-based diet. I mean, and I could go on and on. There's so many things that you can do. If you want to do more, get organized. First, get your own life on order and be a responsible citizen of this planet. But then get organized in whatever you are good at. If you're a doctor, help those people that get in difficulties because of climate change. If you're a good photographer, show the world what is going on on this planet, where it's going wrong, but also show the beauty of the planet. Are you good in social media? reach more people. Are you a good diplomat? Work on planetary security. So that is where everything comes together. There's the dying polar bear. It's not the best symbol of what's going on. When you think about climate change, think about Natanya, because most of you have probably never thought of that kind of relationship. And let's motivate that for you, that we make our planet just the most beautiful island in the whole universe. Thank you.